fantastic. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the third seminar, webinar, Zoominar, call it what you like, on neurological associations of COVID-19. Uh, my name's Professor Tom Solomon. I'm based at the University of Liverpool. Uh, my guests today include Kiran Thacker. You want to say hi, Kiran? Hi, everybody. And Paul Lingo. Hello. Great, thank you. And we have uh, attendees from all over the place. Uh, we're going to use the chat function today uh, so that uh, people can send questions in. So if you would like, just as a startup, just to check if it's working. Uh, actually, we're using the we're using the question we're using que question and answer we said so on your zooms you'll see a QA and a thing so what i'd like you to do is to type in where it says question just type in and let us know your name and where you're from and maybe what your specialty is that would help us so let's just see uh some of those questions coming in and i'm not seeing any at all which means maybe we should be using the chat function oh there we are seju jacob from uh, birmingham hi good to have you join us Someone else from Birmingham. Obviously, it's quite quiet in Birmingham at the moment. All right, here's some uh, comments coming in. Okay, good. Just gives everyone. Now, Australia. So I was just before this, I was doing a, a, uh, a call with ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Company, who wanted to know all about COVID and the brain, and they're putting that out on Monday. Okay, good. We've got a great collection of people coming in. Netra from uh, India, a neurologist there, who's a friend and colleague who always joins. All right, well, we'll let, whilst people are doing that, we'll get started. So um, I am here at the University of Liverpool. I'm the director of the NHR Health Protection Research Unit in Emerging and Zoonotic Infections. And I'm also a neurologist based at the Walton Neurocenter. And uh, so I've introduced today's speakers. Uh, we'll come back to them in a minute or so. And uh, I'm based at the Walton Neurocenter, which is a tertiary neurocenter covering about three million people in the northwest of England. Uh, and this is the uh, infection portfolio here at the university. So the Health Protection Research Unit, which I'm director of, has been involved in a whole range of emerging infections. We were involved in Ebola and then Zika, and now of course, COVID-19. And it's a partnership between the University of Liverpool, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and Public Health England. Uh, my research group uh, studies brain infections. Uh, we've been doing this for about 20 years or so, and we are a collaboration of all the relevant disciplines that you need to understand some of these very challenging areas of science. And these are the major research disciplines that we address, and I'm showing here some of the uh, senior people in the team. We run a, a clinical service, which we have run here in Liverpool since 2005. Uh, that's Nick Beeching, the colleague with whom I started it, although there's now many more doctors involved, both from the neurology and the infection side. And uh, we have the research group was founded in 2003, and we have a, a, an infectious disease course, neurological infection course we run every year. We have a network of hospitals across the UK who contribute to our studies. And um, we also have many international collaborations. We've worked with many partners around the world over the years. Uh, in more recent years, we consolidated this into a platform, if you like, called Brain Infections Global. And our main uh, areas of work through Brain Infections Global are in India and Brazil and Malawi. But we also have a network of participating hospitals around the world. So the Brain Infections Global has, this is a slightly out of date slide now, uh, Tom, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Your slides aren't progressing. Ah, not at all. No, we're still on the main one. Sorry, ah, everyone, for the technical good. hiccup. Okay. It does say sharing is pause. Bring your shared window to the front. But for me, it is the front. Should I stop sharing and try and share again? Would that be the way to do it? Yeah, let's give that a go. <laughs> Forgive the interrupt, the pause right, yeah, in I'm, proceedings, I'm, everyone. It would have been good to interrupt um, a little bit earlier, but... Never mind. Right. Or maybe I'll just try sharing again now and we'll see what we get. OK. So are you seeing a slide with three yellow images on it? Not yet. No. Nope. All right. Let's stop the share and try again. These are the challenges of uh, the modern era. Let me uh, just go back a tiny bit and then try and share that. Mm. 
Okay. We'll get there. So if I share first, and then if I do that, and then if I do that, is that looking better? Kieran's nodding. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Tom. All right. So, um, uh, so this is the research group that I mentioned earlier. This is the Clinical Infectious Disease Service, Neurological Infectious Service. This is our network of hospitals across the UK. And some of you will have seen the um, paper in Lancet Psychiatry, which came out last week, which was the report of the first 150 or so patients with neurological and psychiatric problems uh, from across the UK. Many of those reports came from hospitals. Uh, many of the patients came from hospitals in our network here. Uh, this is the international collaborators. Uh, this is the Brain Infections Global website. Um, and uh, we are, most of our work is in India, Brazil and Malawi, um, but we have quite a network. And as you can see from this slide here, there's a couple of thousand members. And if you want to join up to the network through the Global Health Network to the Brain Infections Global Team, then you'll hear about all of our events, et cetera. Um, we run a neurological infectious disease course every year. We didn't do it this year. Hopefully by next year, we'll be able to do it in person. We're considering uh, doing it remotely um, via the lovely internet, possibly later in the year, although maybe after today, I won't feel like doing that. But if people will be interested in that, please let us know via the Q&A function, whether you think it's worth doing these kind of online web-based courses. We do have free e-learning modules. We've had those for a long time, so you can access those. And um, also on the Brain Infections Global website, we've had now for a few months our COVID neuro resources and the COVID neuro network. So the resources are shown here. Um, one of the junior members of the team is keeping this updated. It's a daily update of all the publications of relevance to neurological COVID disease. Um, as well as the stuff that's peer reviewed, there are also the preprints. So that's worth having a look at if you want to see the latest articles. And then we also established the COVID Neuro Network right at the start of the pandemic, really, just to share our resources with people who also wanted to look at patients with some of these problems. And um, on the uh, network webpage, you just register and then you immediately get sent these forms, which include case record forms and also case definitions. It's really important that we use common case definitions, which is why we put this stuff out there. Um, this has evolved a little bit since then. So um, we've had people collecting data all around the world and we're now putting all these data together into this individual patient data meta-analysis. And many of you are signed up to this already, but if you want to contribute to this, uh, then go onto the website. You can contribute patients that you've already published, patients that you've not yet published, but are gonna publish, and, and also patients that you, you, you only want to publish through our article. Um, the, many of the patients in the meta-analysis are those who we reviewed through this uh, review in the Lancet Neurology, which is now in press, and I think coming out possibly tomorrow. Um, so um, that's worth having a look at as well. Now, uh, good, that's me with my propaganda. There'll be a bit more propaganda at the end. I'm gonna hand over to Kieran in a second, but Kieran, I just thought, I was trying to, I mean, we met each other a, a while back. When was it that we first met? I've got a feeling it was in Geneva, but just-, just Yeah, it was in Geneva. It was definitely in Geneva, I, rem I remember, yeah. Yeah, so it's been now several years, I think around Zika time period, so. Was it Zika? I couldn't remember what it was. Okay, great. Well, it's, it's fantastic to have you join us. I know you're, you've sent patients in already for the meta-analysis. And so uh, I'll stop my screen share now and then we can hear your presentation. Great. Hi, everybody. You can see and hear everything okay? We can. We've got you. Yeah. We're just going to hide our videos. Okay. Fantastic. So um, I hope everyone is doing well and is safe uh, all around the world. Um, I want to thank uh, Tom and the Brain Infections Global Group for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, just as Tom showed you some of the resources, um, you know, throughout the course of this outbreak, I think keeping pace with um, the evolution of literature that is emerging and 
uh, and all the data that is coming coming out so rapidly. You know, I, I check the neural resource website every day. That's kind of my go-to in terms of just keeping up with things. So certainly I think a welcome resource throughout the world. And uh, I'm sure many of you who are listening in uh, are participating and also um, uh, leveraging the material. So today I'm going to talk to you um, briefly about some of the neurological conditions we're seeing with a um, emphasis on looking at potential neurotropism of COVID-19. And I think we're really at a phase right now where we're in these kind of early exploratory phase. And really it's more of the unknown rather than the known. But I think that uh, this is an exciting frontier. Obviously a lot of people uh, are doing ongoing research, including Tom and others that I think will provide important input and kind of color what we're seeing primarily right now in case reports and small case series. So the following are my disclosures. So I wanted to kind of contextualize this around uh, what we're seeing, I think in general with regards to research. So prior to COVID, as many of you are aware, there's been a lot of emphasis on transparency and kind of bringing to forefront literature in a more rapid fashion. I think we all understand some of the challenges that come with peer reviewed literature. And so there's been now these platforms that have really exploded in the time of COVID um, that provide preprint literature. But, you know, these have come, I think, uh, with benefits, but also with risks. So there's been a number of preprint as well as print um, peer reviewed literature that has been uh, retracted with kind of problems in the analysis or reanalysis done. And so I think as we read literature, and I'll talk to you a little bit about this with regards to the neurological literature that's out there, we really have to read things very carefully uh, and interpret them with some skepticism. And I think, you know, an eye on uh, why it's so important that we have a lot of details right now, often in very complex clinical situations. I urge you, for, for those of you who have not read this science policy article on pandemic research, it's incredibly valuable to kind of go through and understand the importance of why we shouldn't be lowering scientific standards in the context of this ongoing pandemic. So with regards to uh, neurological publications around COVID-19, you know, as I mentioned, we're really in the, I think, phases, although we're beginning to kind of see these larger cohorts of patients, including, uh, you know, Tom's wonderful work with the surveillance in England, um, where we've relied on kind of isolated case reports in these case series. Uh, and I just want to highlight a few of them, uh, because I think some of the interpretation and then uh, kind of emphasis on findings uh, has been problematic and also has led to kind of downstream effects of interpretation in other studies and reviews. So this was a correspondence piece that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine now at least a few weeks ago. This was a critically ill population in which they evaluated what they called as uh, neurological consequences after removal of neuromuscular blockade and sedation uh, in a group of 58 patients. And they found that there was a significant number of patients who had uh, what they describe as neurological findings. Although I think for all of us who are listening as neurologists, things like you know, confusion and cortical spinal tract findings, which may be correlated with ongoing sedative effects, can be challenging to interpret. And again, you know, I think to the credit of the authors, they really are trying to color a picture, but are not allowed to really do that in these types of correspondence pieces, which are kind of incredibly narrow in terms of their word limitation, et cetera. They also describe findings on MRI and PET scan, and I highlight some of these here. There was um, a letter to the editor um, in which you know, the authors describe leptomeningeal enhancement, some nodular enhancement on a number of the brain MRIs, as well as hypoperfusion in the frontal and temporal lobes. Um, and this letter to the editor really points out, and I agree that uh, you know, these findings uh, were really, I think, um, I couldn't appreciate them, at least on the images that they provided. And that's what this letter to the editor also describes. But, you know, this has been um, described in now many pieces. And so I think the question is, is, you know, what does it mean? What did they actually see? How was it interpreted? And all of those are really important as we, as we sift through all the information that's coming out. 
These are a few case reports which describe an infectious meningoencephalitis associated directly and I think correlate kind of a causal relationship, which is the problem I have with these studies. Uh, these are isolated case reports. The first case received quite a bit of publicity um, and described, I think, a very interesting case of a 24-year-old who had a very acute presentation of um, seizures and encephalopathy, had this medial temporal lobe um, flare hyperintensity and also some enhancement, I believe. And interestingly, the CSF SARS-CoV-2 was positive um, and there was a, um, there was a, a cytosis of 12 mononuclear nuclear cells, but the NP aspirate was negative. There's no discussion of whether that was repeated, um, what other laboratory tests showed that may be consistent with a possible or probable diagnosis of um, SARS-CoV-2. And then in terms of the workup for this lesion in the temporal lobe, it was really lacking in terms of etiologies. And there was really a lack of discussion that this may be related to seizures itself, which certainly we see. Uh, the next case was a meningoencephalitis complicated with intracranial hemorrhage. And what the authors found was that on removal of the intracranial hemorrhage intraoperatively, they found evidence of SARS-CoV-2. But there's no discussion of whether, you know, systemic blood was tested for SARS-CoV-2. And we know, you know, in a number of patients that we can identify SARS-CoV-2 in blood samples. So, you know, I think correlating this directly with a possible infection is problematic. And then this was a really interesting case of a, you know, clinically, this patient really did look like having a kind of rhomboencephalitis type picture. And you can see here in the image that there is kind of these flare changes, although I didn't see any kind of enhancement uh, in any of the images that were provided uh, in this patient who developed uh, unsteady gait, diplopia, oscillopsia, had systemic, uh, had SARS-CoV-2 by PCR. Um, the CSF was completely bland and uh, CSF's COVID PCR was negative. So again, I think this kind of direct causal link linkage can, can be problematic. It's not that it doesn't exist, but I, I think the literature that's currently out there, um, we haven't really found that linkage uh, to, uh, to be defined. And this is also important in terms of Tom's point and why you know, their network is so important in terms of defining cases clearly and how we define an infectious meningoencephalitis, for instance. So, um, so I think, you know, why, why the devil is in the details in these cases is because the patients that we're seeing are incredibly complex. As many of you know, when we treat patients who have neurological infectious diseases or para post infectious phenomenon, um, and with SARS-CoV-2, um, the pattern of what we're seeing in terms of the effects on coagulation pathways, uh, systemic inflammation, patients who are critically ill, uh, oftentimes our patients were receiving things like ECMO. Um, we have to kind of paint that picture as neurologists when we're kind of assessing uh, our cases. And that has, I think, really been important as we've delved into um, into the cases that we've reviewed. And this is from a review article that was recently published uh, in JAMA Neurology by Ken Tyler and Igor Koralnik, just defining some of the categories and some of the factors that may be associated with some of the neurological manifestations that we're seeing. And so I think, you know, one of, um, one of my goals was to kind of try to tease out whether there is any kind of primary infectious or parapost infectious phenomenon and how we do that. And so really the two ways that I think we're able to do that most effectively is looking at the cerebrospinal fluid and also looking at brain autopsy samples. And I'll just talk to you briefly about some of that. So um, I just wanted to point out that with regards to the CSF SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR data. So, you know, there really hasn't been uh, a lot out there in terms of um, CSF samples and positivity. So there's been isolated case reports that have described positive CSF SARS-CoV-2. There was this um, interesting piece in Lancet Microbe. Uh, again, this was kind of a, a letter, so very short piece, in which um, a national virology lab in France took all of the samples that they had received during the kind of height of COVID and uh, tested it for CSF SARS-CoV-2. Only 23 of the 578 samples that they 
had were two of them were positive and 23 had definitive SARS-CoV-2. So it was certainly a mixed population, but their point was that we really shouldn't necessarily be screening everybody who has CSF done during this time period for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR. So we looked at our data recently with regards to our patients who received LP for uh, clinical purposes. And I think one of the challenges during this time period is that um, the reasoning behind doing ancillary testing, including LPs, can be incredibly challenging. And we had a very high threshold to, to do these studies. Um, one, because of the highly transmissible agent that we were dealing with, we had you know, significant limitations in PPE, and we also had, you know, I think, a lot of challenges with regards to kind of access to care during the height of uh, kind of our local pandemic. What we found in a subset of eight patients who had definitive SARS-CoV-2 is that uh, RT-PCR was negative in all our samples. And then we had an additional group that had possible and probable um, SARS-CoV-2 and all their CSF were negative as well. Many of these patients, as you can see here on the upper right, had uh, evidence of ischemic strokes, hemorrhages. Um, a few had patterns of leptomeningeal or dural enhancement, um, and this was before they had their lumbar puncture done. Um, and then a number of them, and I haven't presented this data here, but you know, at least 40% of this population clearly had abnormal CSF profiles out of proportion of what we kind of would expect to see with ischemic strokes and hemorrhages. And so the question is really why that is and, um, and whether CSF SARS-CoV-2 PCR specifically is a good test in the CSF uh, is one of the questions that kind of came about from what uh, the work we did. So I think one issue is the timing. So um, the viral load kinetics in the CSF is unknown. It's not a validated test in the CSF. CSF is, um, is impacted by sampling procedures. There can be mismatching between primers and probes. And so interpreting a negative result, I think is also complicated. And again, I think as we look at the literature, we need to think about that. So, um, so some of our work also at this stage, um, because in New York City, we've kind of reached at least, you know, hopefully our first and last peak has been to look at the para and post infectious phenomenon that we're seeing. Um, and interestingly, in the literature, there's been these descriptions of a acute hemorrhagic necrotizing leukoencephalopathy, um, akin to what was seen predominantly in pediatrics in the influenza population. And so you can see here on the left um, screen. This is the case report that was written out of Detroit of a patient who had a AHNE type picture. Uh, there was susceptibility abnormality in that image um, and the patient actually ended up improving. Um, this middle picture is from a case that was written in one of our neurology journals and you can see the susceptibility in the medial temporal lobes as well as the brainstem, which is quite extensive. And then on the right, this is actually one of the cases that we have. And I don't necessarily think this is acute hemorrhagic necrotizing leukoencephalopathy, but there's certainly interesting images. So I wanted to share now this case and just a few others to describe again, I think some of the questions that we have rather than answers. So this was um, a pediatric patient who was 33 months old, who had um, two days of symptoms of fever, emesis, and also an erythematous rash on their legs, um, had come in and respiratorily was stable initially, um, and then declined after being admitted, had a positive SARS-CoV-2 antibody, and was treated for multi-system inflammatory syndrome uh, with a number of agents, including our protocol here is to give IVIG, uh, high-dose steroids, and anakinra. The patient then uh, went on to um, develop worsening respiratory status, as I mentioned, had evidence of pleural effusions, um, and then also had elevation of their inflammatory markers while they were receiving this treatment with um, IVIG steroids and the anakinra. And during this time period, not on sedation, the patient became severely encephalopathic where they were only awakening to noxious stimuli had an EEG that showed diffuse slowing, as you can see here on the upper left. And interestingly on MRI had these uh, restricted diffusion lesions in their thalami. 
Um, and the patient essentially without any intervention improved from a neurological standpoint on their own outside of treating the systemic infl inflammation. And, uh, and those lesions reversed. So you can see the MRI was normal on hospital day 15. So I think the question here is, was there something about the systemic inflammatory response that was giving these lesions? Why is it so striking this kind of bilateral uh, evidence in the thalami, which I thought was really fascinating. This is another case that was just discharged yesterday from our hospital and uh, was incredibly challenging. It's a uh, unfortunate 27 year old female who had come in with COVID-19 pneumonia uh, back in kind of the early days when we were seeing this in early March, had a very long hospital stay initially with over 58 days in the ICU. The hospital course was complicated by ARDS, cytokine storm, multiple nosocomial infections, was eventually discharged after all this kind of stabilization, received PAG and trach, and in the rehabilitation unit, was noted to have ongoing encephalopathy, but also flaccid quadriplegia, which was, I think, elicited and uh, explained by possible critical illness, myopathy, neuropathy, kind of during the hospital course. So the patient had a brain MRI that was done by rehab, and you can see these interesting lesions here. So um, we see here that there was restricted diffusion in the substantia nigra. And then again, we see similar to those other cases in the basal ganglia, predominantly here in the GPI, the susceptibility, abnormality. And so we, um, we brought the patient back. We were concerned about kind of a post-infectious inflammatory process that this could be a necrotizing leukoencephalopathy and wanted to treat. The patient was tapped. The initial tap was very bloody, but we felt like this protein of 807 was really out of proportion to the blood that we were seeing and hard to explain by kind of just what we were seeing with this necrotizing encephalopathy. So did a further workup for that. Uh, the patient had an EMG nerve conduction study, which showed, you know, a severe sensory motor polyneuropathy with active denervation in the right leg and arm. Uh, right arm and leg, sorry. And, um, and we also obtained an MRI of the spine, which showed enhancement of the cauda echina roots. So this is clearly like a mixed picture of a lot of things going on in this patient. We ended up giving therapeutic plasma exchange. We chose that over IVIG because of this kind of hypercoagulability we've been seeing with COVID um, and gave, uh, did not give high dose steroids because of the concern that there was a component of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome here. Uh, and also because we were concerned about systemic infections. Interestingly, we just got results back that the CSF COVID antibody in a second tap, which was a champagne tap, was positive. So finally, and I won't spend too much time on this, uh, our work has involved autopsy studies. This is just some background in terms of, I think, the mix of what we're seeing with uh, brain autopsies in the context of COVID-19. So this left chart is from the New England Journal of Medicine piece looking at um, a series of 18 patients who had a brain autopsy at their hospital center at, at MGH and Brigham. And what they found is that diffusely every patient had evidence of hypoxic ischemic injury. So these were, you know, obviously the most severe of patients in the ICUs, et cetera. And what they found, you know, on RT-PCR testing was that there were patients who had evidence, you know, kind of scattered, as you can see here with this heat map, a positive RT-PCR. But the conclusion was really that we don't know what the significance of that is and that it's not consistent because there was no immunohistochemistry analysis that, was, um, that showed evidence of an encephalitis. This contrasts with what the images show or interpreted as in this lower right-hand corner, which was a kind of brief Lancet piece in which they can't claimed that they saw direct evidence of an encephalitis, although don't describe, at least that I could find, any um, RT-PCR results or immunohistochemistry. And then this upper right um, picture is uh, a patient who had a very complicated hospital course who actually developed COVID after um, being in the hospital status post cabbage, cabbage and had this evidence of diffuse petechial hemorrhages and pallor uh, on some of these lesions. So we have just started to look at our um, autopsy cases. This is an interesting one of a patient who came in essentially with a massive, massive cerebellar hemorrhage. And interestingly, and I think surprisingly to all of us, had evidence of uh, neuronophagia uh, predominantly in 
uh, their inferior olivary nuclei, as well as microglial nodules. Um, we saw low levels of viral RNA in the nasal epithelium, olfactory bulbs, and cerebellum, um, but did not find evidence of virus by RT-PCR in the regions that were sampled that found these abnormalities, including the uh, evidence of neuronophagia. So kind of questions to still be answered and how this all correlates with COVID-19, I think we're still scratching our heads. So, um, so that's what I wanted to kind of talk to you about today. I wanted to kind of give you a sense of the complexity that we're seeing and hopefully that um, raise more questions that we can all answer together. Great, thank you very much, Kiran. Um, let's just, if you want to stop your screen share and we'll get Paul back as well. <clears throat> and um, that's really interesting. I think you made some, some really uh, good and important points there, particularly at the start about this desire for people to publish anything uh, and anything and everything and without necessarily giving it too much thought. And you clearly have given a lot of thought to those patients you've been seeing. We've, we've got some questions that have come in. So um, <clears throat> I'll take some of these and then also I, I've got some further comments and, and Paul may as well. Firstly, from Thomas Jackson. Doesn't say where he is actually, but anyway, he says, thanks. Uh, a great presentation, of course. In the CSF samples, uh, he wants to know, was there a preponderance of leukocytes and in particular monocytes or what did the CSF picture look like? Um, because yeah. there's a monocyte recruitment in the lungs in COVID-19. Yeah, so it was very mixed, um, honestly. I can, I, can, uh, I can share kind of the overall kind of picture is that it was mixed. I mean, in some patients we saw neutrophilic predominance. There were um, many that had a lymphocytic predominance. So I wouldn't say there was like a clear pattern that we were seeing. I mean, this is a, this is a cohort of patients who are getting tapped for clinical purposes. Um, so, you know, again, it, you know, they had a variety of different types of lesions. It wasn't just that they necessarily were thinking this is primary infection. A lot of them had hemorrhages and the CSF was taken off of EBD drain. And we know that that can also affect CSF sampling and kind of the differential, so. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Just, uh, yeah, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, Kieran, thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting talk. So to your second case, uh, as, as, as someone working with Parkinson's disease, I was very interested oh, yeah. to, see, uh, to see these uh, abnormalities. Smaller movement disorders. <laughs> right, right. In, in, in this ascension agra, did you actually see any, any rigidity or any bradykinesia in this patient? Uh, did you see yeah. any specific signs of Parkinson's disease? So, so she is, I mean, essentially her exam is that she is completely flaccid and quadriplegic, has very slight movement of her face. Um, does a little bit, so she pur purses her lips. So one question we had was, you know, is there cranial nerve involvement? Uh, given what we saw with her, um, with her EMG nerve conduction study and the kind of cauda roots, but really it was this kind of very profound flaccid quadriplegia, which I think is multifactorial. I mean, you, there's clearly a component of critical illness here. Um, I think the question and <laughs> what's intriguing is, you know, is there GBS on top of that? I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts. I mean, you know, we kind of, uh, we're trying to piece it all together, so. Let me just give you a couple more questions from here. Um, firstly, from uh, Lamwaka Alice Veronica, who I think is in um, Uganda, she says, yeah. Uh, she says, um, in Africa, children are getting chronic flu mixed with bacterial secondary infections. Do you think there's any possibility of secondary infections being important here? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I didn't mention this in our, in our CSF study. So one important thing is that, um, and kudos to the clinical team in the ER who, who tapped this patient immediately. There was a patient who had strep pneumo meningitis. I don't think this was a secondary infection, but their clinical presentation was that they had COVID kind of on the side and they had a strep pneumo meningitis. So one of our points in this piece is that, you know, we should still be thinking about the things that we always should be thinking about as neurologists and uh, yeah, infectious Absolutely. I'm just, we're gonna move on in a second, but I'll just mention a couple of thoughts from people. One was about, this is from Bag Teshwar Singh, who is one of our fellows who knows you, I think, yeah. in India at the moment. Um, uh, he's wondering whether people have looked for hepatic encephalopathy, perhaps in one of your patients, uh, um, the patient that you presented. And yeah. then um, there's also comments from a geriatrician, Emma Vardy, who's actually been a, a great help with us uh, in thinking about some of the geriatric problems and patients who have delirium, 
stroke encephalopathy and how all that balances out. Um, she, uh, she wants to know really, have you given any thoughts to older people and how things may be a bit different in older people? Yeah, so, so with regards to the first question, um, so... Um, we'll have to be very short so we can move yeah, on. Yeah, so in the, in the patient that had those thalamic lesions, the, the pediatric patient, they had a slight elevation in their ammonia levels, which is interesting. Um, we have been kind of tracking that over time. We're looking at liver findings in conjunction with our brain autopsy findings, so certainly that's relevant. And then, um, you know, certainly I think we've seen, and I think all of us are aware of, I think the um, impact, especially in the U.S. with our nursing home population who has many, you know, many demented patients coming in with COVID-like symptoms, so certainly something that we've seen a lot of. Great, thanks. Well, that's actually a great lead into Paul's talk. Paul, um, we, I was thinking, I mean, I think our contact is through Andrea Winkler, is that right? Who is yeah. leading the that's global, or yes. coordinating the global COVID-19 neuro coalition that we're part of. Um, do, you, do you work with her closely or have you, have you known her for a long she's time? She's working in our department, yes. And actually we have uh, a long history because she's also has been working on ALS and this is one of my subspecialties also. Great. Okay. Well, uh, if, I, if people can keep firing their questions in and we'll get to as many as we can. But uh, meanwhile, Paul, if you want to share your screen and, and go ahead and give us your presentation. Thank you. All right. Can you see my screen? We can see it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, I would like to share with you one case of a patient who was treated in our department, uh, which I think uh, could be instructive and interesting because it, it's a patient uh, with Alzheimer's dementia, so a neurological disease to, to start with, but she also developed a few uh, interesting complications, which we can discuss. So I uh, do not have any disclosures in regard to this case. Uh, I would like to discuss with you this case and then uh, the complications um, and also what we know about Alzheimer's disease uh, and COVID-19. And there's also, of course, many unknowns as in Kieran's talk. So initially she presented at the end of March in our department. She was 79 years old and uh, presented with her husband. And actually the husband reported that she was um, uh, having nausea and vomiting for the last five days and she fainted two times. Um, and that he noted that she was more disoriented and inadequate than usually. And this is important because one of her um, comorbidities was Alzheimer's dementia which was diagnosed in 2018, but of course we know that this may be a very broad spectrum. So she was in, she had a good quality of life. She did regular walks with her husband and she was also able to care for herself. Um, and interestingly, and maybe a point of discussion for later, she had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which was treated with leflunamide. Um, so not a very classical presentation of uh, COVID pneumonia. Um, uh, five days later, when she presented uh, with these symptoms at our ER, um, we took a nasopharyngeal swab, it was positive for SARS-CoV-2, and uh, the um, CT scan showed very typical ground glass opacities, as you can appreciate at the right side, um, suggested for a typical viral pneumonia, and very soon she was um, worsening in her condition, and the decision had to be done whether she wants to go for intubation, yes or no. She, so she has a dementia and for um, two years. And um, it was a decision which was taken together with her and her husband that yes, she wants to uh, go for intubation and ICU treatment because she had a good quality of life. Um, and uh, now we jump a little bit forward. Uh, she had a protracted weaning um, as, as many of these patients, she required tracheostomy um, from the 30th of April. So one month later, she was in continuous CPAP mode. And um, in the beginning of May, she was able to breathe without a ventilator support with moderate uh, oxygen supplementation. So uh, taken together, she was intubated and ventilated for uh, more than a month. Uh, and uh, when um, we started to take away the sedatives, we first noted that she was initially very agitated um, and delirium was diagnosed. And later um, she was presenting more in a soporous uh, condition and this is why we performed a CT scan and also an EEG. And as you can appreciate on the CT scan, you see some mild atrophy, which um, could be um, going very well with her Alzheimer's dementia. And uh, the vessels were free, so basilar artery and every other vessels were free of any obstruction. And the EEG showed more general slowing. So there was no indication of any uh, epileptic activity in her. 
Um, <clears throat> what was also noted later, and we heard this already before from Kieran's talk, that she had very limited spontaneous movements. And when we were able to evaluate her um, neurologically in more detail, we found that she had a two-fifth tetraparesis and the deep tendon reflexes were um, actually completely absent. And these are her nerve conduction studies. And uh, <clears throat> just to make the long story short, we saw a reduction in amplitudes in almost all uh, the measured uh, motor and also sensory nerves, um, while the nerve conduction velocity was uh, almost normal or pretty much normal in her. And of course, uh, if you then perform the EMG, then we found uh, spontaneous activity in the vastus muscle, but in no other muscles. And so this basically gives you a picture of an axonal sensory motor uh, polyneuropathy. And uh, of course, knowing that she had uh, COVID-19, uh, um, we uh, also thought of Guillain-Barré syndrome and performed an MRI scan where we could see a very prominent contrast enhancement and in the caudal fibers and on the CSF tab, um, she had a normal mononuclear cell count, but also an increased uh, ratio of the albumin. Uh, so basically uh, corresponding to increased uh, protein um, content in the CSF. So um, our diagnosis in her was still rather a critical illness polyneuropathy because demyelination was uh, rather, um, rather low, but it also could have been a possible Guillain-Barré syndrome uh, and we will discuss this later because of this protracted time which she was uh, intubated and ventilated. Um, we decided together with her and her husband that we would not do any IVIG therapy because she started to improve after physiotherapy and this was an option also for uh, some later therapy in her. So clinically she was able to breathe spontaneously when we discharged her. She was sitting independently but not yet able to walk, needed uh, help and transfer, and we discharged her into the rehabilitation facility. And I think several things are very interesting in this case. So first of all, um, this is a dementia patient and um, this is um, a paper from uh, colleagues from Italy who presented uh, 82 cases with uh, patients um, with dementia. And very similarly to our patient, they also noted that one of the first things which can be noted in these patients is that they might not have cough or, or fever, uh, but that they can actually present with a functional status worsening. And this is exactly what we found in our patient. So she did not have any cough, although she developed very severe pneumonia. Uh, she also did not have any fever in the beginning. Uh, when we then look <clears throat> at uh, the course of disease in these patients then in this cohort um, of um, patients uh, of 627 patients which they looked at in this Italian group 82 had dementia and uh, 545 was the control group they noted that 62% um, mortality in the dementia patients with a much lower mortality in, in the non-demated population of course you have also to see that these patients with dementia were much older than the non-demated patients here and if you uh, logistically regress out um, other factors, then you still see that dementia per se uh, is a factor which increases mortality by the factor of two according to this publication. Uh, and very similarly, uh, another group was um, uh, showing that uh, the risk, um, the odds ratio for, um, uh, for dying from COVID-19 uh, is increased uh, in patients uh, from dementia. So why is this the case? Um, um, there are several factors which can be discussed, but uh, of course, in patients who suffer from dementia, every hospitalization um, represents uh, an increased stress. So they are in a new condition, they see people who they don't know, um, uh, they might not understand everything which is going on around them. And in addition to other infections which we see in uh, dementia patients in COVID-19, you also always deal with hypoxia. And this can be additionally uh, deleterious because they already have a limited cognitive reserve and are more prone to develop delirium. And of course, also for um, looking at the time before hospitalization and even in the hospital for these patients, it's more difficult to remember safeguarding procedures for themselves. I found it very interesting to see this publication from the group uh, uh, around Henrik Zetterberg and colleagues um, who um, do a lot of research on neurofilament light. And you know, neurofilament light is a destruction marker for many neurodegenerative diseases, most prominently in um, motor neuron disease and ALS. 
Um, and here they studied patients with uh, mild to moderate disease courses with COVID-19 and severe disease courses. And what they can see on repetitive uh, evaluation of neurofilament light is that uh, while in the mild to moderate cases, it remains almost stable, those with a severe um, disease course have an increase in NFL. And this uh, points us a little bit to the direction that maybe this is not just an epiphenomenon, but that there is really uh, exonal damage going on in these patients. And particularly if we think about uh, patients with dementia, this could be crucial uh, in, um, in deteriorating their uh, symptoms. Another point in our patient, which was worth uh, discussing, and that's why I put it rather to discussion, was whether she had Guillain-Barré syndrome, yes or no. Um, and as I said, I mean, very much of it also points towards a critical illness, polyneuropathy. On the other hand, uh, many publications show that it may present, Guillain-Barré syndrome may present five to 21 days after SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we also know that this disease may be different in its, uh, whether it is very pronounced or not. And it also has some spontaneous recovery, at least partially. So in our patient, it might have just well be that we looked at a status where, which was already past her first um, uh, GBS. Um, and uh, that, uh, that this is a mixed picture with the critical illness polyneuropathy, which we can appreciate there. Also of note is that uh, reduced vital capacity, of course, can occur in GBS patients and uh, in patients who um, already have a problem with respiration, this might additionally pose problems. Usually these patients respond well to IVIG, uh, but they also can, of course, uh, develop SIP uh, in a later time course. So my take home messages, and I will stop with that, is that um, one should um, be aware that globally 50 million people suffer from dementia. Uh, and uh, that they have a higher risk for infection because they uh, might have more difficulties to remember their safeguarding procedures on one hand. And on the other hand, of course, because many of these people live in nursing homes where uh, they have other people having to care for them. Um, in COVID-19 patients, initial symptoms, and I think this is very important for everyone working on the ER, um, they may be different than um, classical symptoms like fever and cough or even reported smell and olfaction and, and uh, gustatory loss. Um, and the risk of death is increased in patients uh, with dementia and of course, polyneuropathy, um, SIP and GBS can be a major complication also for respiration, um, but also of course for mobility in this uh, population. So this is um, a case which I wanted to share with you and I'm very happy uh, to answer your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's <clears throat> thank you. That's a really great case. Really interesting case, um, and it raises raises a lot of issues um, about the actually what's happening in that patient, and then also about the management of these patients more broadly. Kiran, do you want to give your thoughts on on that case? Yeah, I mean it's interesting because I think some of the same issues kind of arose <laughs> with the with the case that I presented at the end, right? This complicating factor in regards to the kind of peripheral nervous system and, and what's going on. So, um, and I certainly agree with you, Paul, about some of the challenges with, um, with patients that have dementia. So, great talk. Do you, do you think we're, Paul, do you think we're, we're missing, potentially missing patients because we're not picking up on these, some of these early deteriorations in their cognitive function and not recognizing that this could be a presentation with COVID-19? Well, from looking at at studies where we look at seropositivity in the population, we know, of course, that there are a number of patients who um, had uh, COVID-19 without having pronounced symptoms. So I think it's, it's very important because this population group should be looked for very closely because they might not report symptoms which are new. So if um, healthcare workers or their relatives note some differences in their behavior, this is definitely something also to look for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In, in some UK hospitals, every, everybody uh, that gets admitted is getting a swab for mm -hmm. the virus. Is that the case in, in Germany and in New York? Well, well, in Germany, that's, that's not particularly the case, but at the time where we had a very strong um, influx of, of patients with COVID-19, we had very severe um, or very low criteria to screen uh, for patients um, for COVID-19, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are, we're testing everybody that comes in, although that was not um, protocol at the beginning. 
And I mean, for all of those of you who are listening in, we really had to advocate for our neuro patients who we knew would come in with recrudescence and you know the symptoms that Paul so nicely were de was describing to get tested right away. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that was a huge push we had. And there were a number of those patients that were positive. What about, um, so Emma, uh, Emma Vardy, again, our friend in Manchester, who's become my best friend over the last week or so, as she's helped us make sense of delirium, uh, is asking, should delirium or acute confusion be on the presenting features list? Just that itself, do you think that should be enough to say this could be COVID-19, we should be swabbing these people? I think definitely, yeah. I mean, and this, this patient presents it very nicely. So she did not present any classical, let's put it classical, which probably there is no classical, but uh, she did not present any respiratory symptoms in the beginning. So what her husband describes is she was different than before. She was also, um, she, she went to the bathroom when she didn't need to, and she used things she didn't want to use. So uh, this could be definitely more than just confusion. Uh, and uh, probably if that would have been gone on at, at home, that would have been developed into a full-blown delirium, yes. Mm. Um, and then Bagteshwar Singh, who is, is our fellow, but has been seconded to spend some time with the WHO, says that it is people are leaning towards considering delirium as a prompt. And in fact, we have a WHO group now looking at uh, case definitions for neurological disease. Um, Thomas Jackson, again, just wants us to think a bit more about the uh, this risk of infection and whether it's related to immune senescence, i.e., you know, the fact that the immune system is not so strong in old people rather than not adhering to protocols. What, what do you think the contribution might be? Well, I think um, it's, it's an interesting question. However, uh, I mean, if we know uh, or we put together what we know about the function of the immune system here, then it might even be a protective fa factor for, um, for someone to not have a very strong uh, immune reaction or a very strong cytokine storm uh, in COVID-19. And um, I, I kind of um, disregarded one fact which I presented at the very beginning. So this patient actually was treated with leflunomide for her rheumatoid arthritis. And of course, we cannot say what would have happened if she wouldn't have been treated with leflunomide. So she had an immune suppressant already to start with. And maybe this was a factor which alleviated parts of her uh, symptoms. So I do not think that we can clearly say that a senescent immune system is deleterious in COVID-19 and that there is also different other factors which contribute to that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to come back to one thing um, that Kiran talked about. You, one of your patients, you gave them Anna Kinra. Um, so are you using that a lot? You, you may have seen the pu publication in Lancet Rheumatology. I think the French gave it to 50 patients and compared it with 50 earlier patients who had not had it. They seem to have quite promising results. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, um, so we are giving that as um, standard protocol for the um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome patients. Um, and there was a lot of debate um, in terms of kind of early immunomodulatory treatment uh, for our adult patients. And the rheumatologists really were advocating a lot for anakinra. We ended up not doing that. And there's been a lot of ongoing kind of randomized control trials that were a part of with the IL-6 inhibitors. Um, but I think it's interesting, and I agree with Paul's point, right? This is, this is complicated. I think there's, there's risk factors initially that, that, that uh, allow for patients to develop COVID, right? But then, and, and that may be related to kind of immune system dysfunctioning or immune, immune senescence. But then later down the road, what happens in terms of the kind of spectrum of what we see with severity and how is that modified, right? And so there's been a lot of literature in terms of disease modifying therapies for the MS population using interferons um, around COVID as well. Mm. Great. Um, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna stop there. Just a final thing, because Durjoy Lahiri sent a message in a while ago about do we think the anosmia may relate to temporal lobe involvement uh, rather than no, the nose itself being involved. What, Paul, do you have any thoughts on that? whilst I just pull up the last couple of slides. I probably would rather think that this is really a sign of involvement of the olfactory bulb uh, or even, even the fibers in the nose itself. 
Um, there is animal data which shows that um, SARS-CoV-2 can actually travel to the brain, but I think this has really to be shown more uh, thoroughly for the human population. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, well, great. Thank, thank you both. Let me just show these final couple of slides. Um, I, uh, I, I mentioned the uh, publication we had from the UK with 500 or so patients. So here it is. This is the one in the Lancet Psychiatry. You can see from the image, uh, the top right image there, that the patients in our study more or less match the patients that we're seeing across the country as a whole in terms of ages. And um, uh, this next image shows you how they broke down. It was basically all we did was just uh, ask for a diagnosis from the reporting centres. It was an original um, register and then we're getting more information at the moment but you can see that of about 125 patients uh, for whom we had appropriate information available 60% um, of them had a cerebrovascular event of some form a third of them had al altered mental status which then breaks down to things like um, uh, delirium encephalitis etc etc psychosis this is probably under reporting on the altered mental status side. I'm sure there are many, many more patients with delirium that, that people didn't report. Um, but anyway, that's, that kind of gives us a snapshot of how things looked in the UK at that time. Um, we mentioned this more comprehensive study we're doing. And if you go onto the COVID Neuro Network website there, um, you'll find information about how to join this individual patient data meta-analysis. So anyone who has data that's published or not published and wants to contribute it. There's the website there at the bottom and there is Susie Lant who is pooling the data, that's her email address. So alternatively, you can just email her. And um, for those who uh, can't get enough of these kind of webinar things, we've also been running uh, not quite such a heavy science, but more conversational discussion. Uh, these Scouse Science podcasts, we've got our next one next Thursday. Um, when we have Dan Wotton, who is one of our respiratory academics here in Liverpool, going to be talking a bit about what's going on in the lungs. And then also Sharon Amezu, who is a, we, we get a scientist and we also get a non-scientist to join us so that we talk in English. And she is a barrister who actually now um, is uh, an advisor on business, um, works up in the Northwest. Very good speaker. So do join us for that next Thursday. You can find that on Eventbrite. Um, if you, this is the way you enjoy spending your lunch hour. Anyway, let me finish there by once again thanking Paul and uh, Kiran for, for some really interesting, really good talks. And thank you everyone for joining in and uh, for the interesting questions via the Q&A. Thanks very much.